Morning, everybody. We're going to be right with you. Okay, wonderful. Ah, uh, used to be you just to start. <laughs> you just start a year, and now there's so many different things you got to do to make sure you're on top of your game. Okay. Morning. Good evening, wherever you are. Thank you for being with us. It's the last song that Reb Shlomo composed, as far as we know. Did it da 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 Did 
Thanks for being with us, everyone. I know this was last second, but no such thing as last second. First second, that's what we have to work with. And we're going to have a really fun session right now. Everything we're doing right now on Rib Shlomo's yard site, of course, is Leilu Nishmato, and also for the Rafua Shlema of Shoshana Bat Chana Chaya. Shavin, absolute Rafua Shlema, Bezrat Hashem, Bekarov Mamash. You know what? We started with the last nigan. How about we start with the first nigan he ever wrote? Also, but we're not going to go through everything because we'll be here till Hanukkah 2027 if we do that. So we're just going to speak about a few specific nigunim, the stories and Torahs behind them. And obviously a little bit of, because almost every nigun has a story behind it. If you have a nigun you really want to know about, if I know if I know the, the, the backstory behind it, I'll be happy to share. Just type it into a chat um, on Facebook or on, uh, or on Zoom. Um, and we'll see. We'll see where we can go. It's a beautiful day here in Eretz Kodesh. Gorgeous here. My God. So lucky. Okay. This is uh, the first one he ever wrote. Not so known, interestingly enough. A little bit less known than the other one. Obviously, everything I'm saying is only stuff that I heard from him directly. I am Tala Kadosh, Veshem Chokodosh, O Kadosh in the Holy And the original words are a little bit different. Asking I'm <laughs> 
If we say that when you quote someone, when you quote a Rav, it's as if that their lips are whispering, are moving in their graves. So, you know, all these Nigunim Arteras, it seems like Rib Shlomo's mouth has been more busy in the last 26 years than it, than it was when he was alive. It's just an unbelievable thing. Last night, my wife and I were at the Kever. We thought we would go at a time where it'd be relatively quiet. I said, quiet, we get there, the place is packed. Packed with so many people that, the truth is so many kids that look like they couldn't be older than 24, 25, which means they came into the world even after Rav Shlomo's passing. But there's the hunger, there's a hunger for these Torahs that are mitlabesh in melodies as well. Usually on the Yodzeit, we, we, we spend so much time uh, with just with text. This year I wanted to do it a little bit differently and spend some time over here with the Nigunim, but also later today, hopefully we'll have a chance to learn. But I also have, like, I don't want to say anything. I remember by heart, I wanted to say exactly from Rib Shlomo. So I want you to hear how he, how he spoke about his world of music, his world of Nigunim before we continue. Um, and again, if anyone has a specific request for a specific song they'd like to know about. And again, if I'm able to help with that, Besimchai, I really believe strongly that when we know the story, the backstory of Nigunim, something happens to the, the way we sing and relate to that Nigun as well. So, um, listen to this. Shlomo said like this, singing for me is like mana from heaven. Each time I open my mouth, I know it's mamish a gift from above. When I was a little boy, people said that I had a sweet voice. I don't have a great voice, but there's a certain sweetness to it. My voice is good enough to make people sing, and it's not good enough to cause people to stop singing in order to listen to it. It's just the right kind of voice to sing together with people. After the Second World War, very few nigunim were composed. Other than mojits and a little bit from the other rebbes, the gates were closed. When I began singing, people were picking up my melodies very fast. There was nothing else going on. Whenever I sing, I always dream and hope the door will open and maybe King David will walk in. King David, the master of singing, the master of the holy land, the master of joy, the master of tears, the master of not giving up. So it's just so beautiful that we're sitting here in the, in the, in the chatzer of King David in the courtyard of King David, as we're uh, hopefully, you know, getting a lot of koch to infuse ourselves with passion and light and simcha and the determination to keep on going, to, to, take, to bring these nigunim to our hearts uh, stronger than we ever did. I'm just gonna say one. Please come to me. I would have to walk around with the cassette recorder. You'll explain to the next generation what that is. I'd have to walk around with the cassette recorder all day long so that I won't forget them. I make up songs day and night. Songs go on in my head day and night. I dream at night of songs. I don't know to write notes, so I always composed many of my melodies while I was learning, while someone was taping my classes. There were times when I would walk around with a melody for years until I found the right words. It's very special to know the right words. My nigunim come from the deepest depths of my neshama. I know it's not coming from my head. It's really coming from the depths of my soul. Sometimes I make up the best songs on Friday night by the Holy Wall, but you can't record it then. There were so many Friday nights by the Holy Wall when I sing Lech Adodi and give out what nigunim came to my head. Someday God will give, give them back to me. So I thought it'd be, it'd be sweet to sing for you a nigun that Rav Shlomo wrote in a dream. It's a nigun that many of you know, but I think it's a beautiful thing. And uh, the story is that it, it, was, it was the year 1964 and he was in Paris. And in those days in the 60s, there were thousands of Jewish students from uh, 
from Morocco and Algeria and and from all over there in Paris. And th these students had mamish nothing to eat. So together with Baron Rothschild, a number of people organized a whole benefit. Uh, uh, they organized a kosher kitchen for the students where they got one kosher meal a day. And uh, in order to get money for the food, they put together a benefit concert. And whatever they raised, let's say they would raise $100,000, Baron Rothschild supplied the rest. So Shlomo said that he was flying from New York to Paris. He was obviously going to perform there. And um, he said that when you're plugged into music, you also dream of it too. So in the middle of the night, um, this melody hit him in his dream. And he woke up and he had a tape recorder with him. So he put it onto tape. And then he introduced the nigga next night on stage with the, following, with, with the words. And uh, Rothschild was sitting in the first row. And he said to him, um, Shlomo said to him, you're supporting the whole world with a lot of money, but how about supporting the world with your own joy? This is what he said to Baron Rothschild. Can you please come on stage and start dancing with me? And then everyone will start dancing after you. And Reb Shlomo said he jumped on stage, grateful and very pleased. And this benefit concert was one of the biggest halls in Paris. And the police were there. And when they saw everyone after the, after the show going out into the street, dancing in the street, they actually stopped traffic. Reb Shlomo estimated there were probably around 2,000 people dancing in, this, in the square uh, there in Paris that night, one of the greatest nights of his life. Regarding his relationship with Baron Rothschild, he said, stupidly enough, <laughs> he didn't keep that friendship going, which he should have. Anyway, this is, this, this is the song that he wrote in the, in the dream. And thank God he had a tape recorder. So like he just mentioned, there are a lot of Nick women that came at the Kotel, and you know many of them. Um, for instance, uh, what came at the Kotel? Um, 
That one came by the cotton also. Um, also, that one came by the Kotel. And also, and many others. One of them that came down by the Kotel is one of my favorite, favorite Nigunim. And we, everyone knows this, but it's so... He called it a... a, a Himamash called it a... Um, a holy wall melody and this was in 1985 it was he was on a trip in Eretz Yisrael and the night before he left he went to the Kotel at four in the morning to go daven he didn't have a guitar with him but he said someone suddenly showed up with the guitar he put it under my nose and a nigun had come down right then and there and um it's such a deep nigun and in the later years of his life after he wrote this not every concert, but for a stretch of years, he used to start every single concert with this song. And we want to dedicate this right now to the people of the world, specifically the Jews in Vienna. And I refer Shlema to all who need. Shomer, Shomer, Israel. Shomer, Shomer, Israel. Shemo, Shemit, Israel. Shemo, Shemit, Israel. Ve'al Yovan, Ve'al Yovan, Ve'al Yovan, Israel. Ha'omrim, Shema, Israel. Shomer, Shomer, Israel. Shomer, Shomer, Israel. Shemor, Shemit, Israel. Shemor, Shemit, Israel. Israel. Aumrim Shema Israel, let's go everyone. Da 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 do 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 da 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 do 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 da 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 do 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 da 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 do 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 Okay, let's stay in Europe. And uh, in the early 60s, it was one year, I think it was 61 or 62, that Reb Shlomo was in Europe, the week before Rosh Hashanah. And he, he was leaving back to New York to get back for Yantiv to New York. He would leave, he left on Monday, on a Monday morning. But Sunday, he said that he, he spent the whole day with kids, with Jewish kids from, from Antwerp and from Amsterdam. Now, you have to realize like Jewish kids in 19, early 60s, are either survivors themselves or they're born into a world of mamash khurban. So 
the most beautiful thing is that he, Reb Shlomo said he bonded with them so strong and when he had to leave he was so sad but he remembered the Pasuk from Shir Hashirim Shlomo HaMelech um, Keshoshana ben achochim ken rayati ben abanot like a rose amongst the thorn so too is my beloved amongst all the women in the world and these kids were so special to him so he, he wrote this nigun for them on the spot and he never recorded it in his life just on a bootleg tape, but um, we try to sing it a lot now. Can you imagine being a kid that receives this nigga, being reminded that you know the world is full of thorns. We are not thorns. We're the roses amongst the thorns. <laughs> Keshoshana beina kochim, Keshoshana beina kochim, Kein rayosi beina Shoshana Baina After we left Rip Shlomo's Kever last night, so when you leave and you start walking down towards the exit, there's a whole section on your right side. Um, on the right side, there's a whole section for like the respected ones and from the from the world of Mir, of the Mir Yeshiva. And a lot of the Rashi Yeshivas from back then and the, mashpi, the, the Mashgichim from the Mir Yeshiva are all buried there. What people don't realize is that Rip Shlomo's sister is buried there also. Uh, where I had the privilege of having a beautiful relationship with. She passed away probably, 15, I don't know, 16 years ago, Mashkaza, 17 years ago. I don't remember exactly. She was, she was so, so sweet. She had told me that they, they used to live in Borough Park and then they lived in uh, Muncie later in life. She told me that um, Venizgov came down in her house in Anamotse uh, Shabbos, in Izgav Hashem Levado. And there's another nigun that came down in her house, a very, very famous nigun that we should sing. Um, I love it. Basically, the Moshe Tzarebbe's granddaughter, Moshe Tzarebbe had a granddaughter, her name was Nechama. And uh, she had gotten engaged. And she had a kefir to Rib Shlomo. She asked Rib Shlomo, she said, for, for my wedding, I want you to write me a nigun. And write a new nigun for me. And he was in his sister's house in Brooklyn when this happened. And this granddaughter of the Moshe Tzarebbe, the Kala, came to visit them. And she said, look, I'm leaving tomorrow for my wedding in Eretz Yisrael. 
And if you're going to make up a new song, you got to knock it off now because I got to take it with me to Eretz Yisrael. And he was sitting there and he was thinking how much the Moshe Tzarebbe had given him so much. He had a beautiful relationship with him. And he always used to say that if he has any connection to, to, to the world of, Nig of, of Nigun, the world of music, it's because he was sitting with the Moshe Tzarebbe Nigunim so much. So he really he took, looked up to Shemaim and said, Rebbe Einstein, have Rachmanus on me, have compassion on me. You got to give me a new Nigun. And this Nigun came down right away. And he, he said it was a very special and gentle nigun. Sometimes people sing it very fast, but it doesn't, you know, who cares? But to him it was mamish, very gentle. And when he used to sing it, it was like this. This is the nigun, how it came down. Barcheinu <laughs> It's time to go to Brazil. We're going to travel a little bit. We're going to go to Brazil right now. And uh, this is a, a very, very beautiful nigun. It got a little bit more popular over the last few years, but he didn't really perform it so much in his life. So this is a nigun that came down in Rio de Janeiro that uh, he was invited to come give a concert there. And a moment right before he went up on stage, they had told him, that there's a custom there that every non-Brazilian citizen that comes to perform has to sing a Brazilian song. Each nation and their own minhag, right? But uh, Portuguese, which is the, the language in Brazil, is a very difficult language. What, what is he supposed to do? He doesn't know any songs in Portuguese. But it happened to him that earlier that morning, it was Rosh Chodesh, and he was davening during Hallel, and a nigun came to him. So... He said, I, I wrote this nigun in honor of Rosh Chodesh, but it happened this morning here in Rio de Janeiro. So it's a Brazilian nigun. And uh, it was the biggest hit of that whole tour, he said. Clap your hands, clap your hands. Oin do Lashem, King Toy, King Leon, and Castoy. Oin do Lashem, King Toy, King Leon, and Castoy. Oin do Lashem, King Toy, King Leon, and Castoy. Oin do Lashem, King Toy, King Leon, and Castoy. Oin do Lashem, King Toy, King Leon, and Castoy. I like the little 
Okay, I'm going to look at some comments. I'm sorry I haven't been looking so much, but let me see any requests for some of the nigunim. Um, okay, so, you know, sometimes you say, when did he write this nigunim? You give the name of a nigun, but he has like six of them. So I'll tell you one of them, Gam I'll, I'll choose one of them. Um, this is an amazing story. This is the nigun that you all know, but this story is amazing. Uh, in 1963, Rip Shlomo had a Malav Malka in the house of Rev Nachum Cook. He was the chief rabbi of Ramat Gan. Shlomo was very close to him. Some of the recordings we have is from uh, the early 60s in, in, uh, in Rev Cook's home. Uh, this Rev Cook was a nephew of, of, of Avram Yitzchak Kokoyin Cook. And he was a priest, like Rip Shlomo called him a prince. He was the princely figure. And one of the Malav Malkas, it just, he said he lasted all night long. And he, he wrote a certain nigun that night. And a bunch of yeshiva bachram were there and they were recording it. And they promised, everyone said they'll, they'll, they, they, that they'll give him a copy of the recording so that he'll remember this nigun, but it never ended up getting to him. This is 1963. And then comes Milchemet Yom Kippurim 10 years later. The Yom Kippur War comes. And Rib Shlomo put things in context of his saying as much as the Six Day War was 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 very heavy. The Yom Kippur War was two million times more heavy because the, the other the enemies had a lot more weapons. And they used it a lot more too. And um, basically, Reb Shlomo was going from hospital to hospital to visit the, the, the injured people, the injured soldiers. And uh, he saw one soldier who was mamish wounded really, really bad. And there are a number of stories of Nigunim that came down like this by the bedside of soldiers like Ibane Amigdash and Orech Yamin. This one is, um, this, this really touched his heart. It broke his heart. And this wounded, wounded soldier started humming a melody. He, he, Rip Shlomo said either he was blind or he just wasn't able to see at that moment. He couldn't see him. But uh, he asked Rip Shlomo, can you hear me? And Rip Shlomo said, yeah, I can hear you. And everyone started crying. And he said to him, uh, Rip Shlomo said to him, this is such a beautiful nigan. Where did you get it from? So this chayal said to him, don't you know? I was there when you made this song up 10 years ago at Rav Cook's house. And he told Rib Shlomo that he was singing this nigun the whole time he was wounded. And uh, right after he got injured, he was standing, he was guarding on the chermon and he got injured and he, he said he could mamish see Avram Yitzchak and Yaakov, Sir Rif Garochim, guarding with him. And Baruch Hashem, that this soldier ended up being healed and making it out of life. And the first concert, the first concert that Rip Shlomo did after the Yom Kippur War, he recorded this live because uh, now that he remembered it, how could he not? But in the schools of this wounded soldier who held on to a nigun like, you know, for 10 years, which is just kind of mind blowing because this nigun is known in the whole world. Gam 
a bit more from him about the world of music. Shlomo said, he said like this, a nigun always comes by heavenly federal express. It could come at time, at times during the day or the night, sometimes at night. Like you said before, I dream of such unbelievable nigunim, but sadly enough, when I wake up, it's forgotten. Quite often, real good nigunim come to me when I'm mamish heartbroken. Then I realize that if I wouldn't be completely broken, I wouldn't have vessels for this melody. And this is connected to a teaching that he used to say in the name of the Baal Shem Tov, that in Yom, on Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, in Yom Kippur, Chassidim would say in the name of the Baal Shem Tov, if it wasn't for such tremendous averas, which caused such heartbreak, you would have never ever gotten such gevald heartbreaking nigunim, Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur. So you might as well Michael us. So Reb Shlomo said, "This is really beautiful. I my favorite, my favorites of my own songs change every few weeks. It's usually the song I compose last, which is strongest in my head, as well as the song I didn't compose yet, which is strongest in my head." I generally only sing my own songs. I sing my own songs the best. When people pay to hear me, I want to give them the best I have. The song I can sing from the depths of my heart is my own. We're living in a world with so much imitation. If I do not imitate, it's already a great thing. My songs have a lot of rhythm. They also have a lot of longing, crying, and joy with them. They have within it everything a person needs. I think that good music is something that touches every emotion in your heart. Joy, sadness, bitterness, hope, desperation, everything together. Singing comes from that deep place in me where my whole life stands in front of me. A lot of times when I'm singing or talking during my singing, things, up, things come to my head which don't come to me ordinarily. There are moments that I'm, when I'm singing that I'm really high, higher than drugs could ever take me. Even though I sing my own songs, they still have a Hasidic flavor. In former good days, Hasidic music was only in the synagogue. And I had the privilege of taking it out onto the street. 
One time I came to Eretz Yisrael and I was really downhearted. I was staying in a hotel in Be'er Sheva. I was going through a lot. The next morning I woke up and my window was open. And I heard three people singing in the garden of the hotel. One was a gardener, one was a little girl of seven, and one was a person who was passing by. And all three were singing one of my songs. I thought to myself, maybe I really did something in this world. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> maybe. If Shlomo was once talking about these heartbreaking moments where Shlomo was once in an airport in Brussels, famous story. He was in an airport in Brussels and, and uh, it was a lonely night in the airport, dark winter night. And uh, he had just come from London to Brussels and strangely enough, he was the only passenger on the flight. And uh, as he walked on the ground in Belgium, so he suddenly heard the cries of all his brothers and sisters whose blood was still warm, he said because this is about 10 years, 15 years after the gas chambers. Reb Shlomo said that as he listened carefully, their voices mingled with our voices. Reb Shlomo said that while all of his heart was crying, his soul was singing a new song, paving the way. Sing with me, Chavar. Mikdash <laughs> Mitochafeka <laughs> You can literally feel what it physically and, and emotionally you feel that airport, that lonely, better feeling when the snigger came down. Let's do it again. I mean, All right. So let's do another one that everyone knows. One that everyone knows. We could do all the unknown ones also day and night, but let's do one that you all know. What year is it? It's 1974. In 1974, Shlomo had a nigun that he wrote in New York. And like he said before, that sometimes a nigun would come down and it would take a long time until the right words came to it. Sometimes it's a span of years. Um, here was a span of a few months. That summer, Reb Shlomo was in, was in Eretz Yisrael, like he was, came out every summer, and he was by the Kotel. And Reb Shlomo said that the Kotel had two, has two, two types of Kedusha. One is when there's basically a lot of people there, and it's really, really holy, packed. But also, you know, there's late at night when no one's there, also has a deep kind of Kedusha as well. 
Reb Shlomo said he likes it when it's just a few schleppers late at night. And um, Reb Shlomo said that when his friends, when his chaver went, go down to the holy, holy wall, it's usually like two in the morning. And this was an example of two in the morning. And, um, so, you know, very, very fast. Suddenly, like, you know, a few people from here come, a few chaver from here gather, and there's like a whole mob of people. But Reb Shlomo said it was a lonely kind of mob. Meaning, Reb Shlomo always said that there's, there's nothing wrong with being lonely, but why not be lonely together? Because we're all lonely. So it was like a lonely kind of mob. And Reb Shlomo said he started talking to the crowd there, all, all the people that gathered. And lo and behold, every person was from a different country. He said that two people just came from India, some Hevra came from South Africa, some from South America. There were people there from the whole world, and he right away was to, was brought to the Machzor, to the words of, of well, the Midrash, like the Midrash says that on the great day, you know, everyone will hear the blowing of the shofar, and, the, and we speak about this uh, in Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, and those who got lost in the world of happiness, and those who are outcast because of the pain will all come back home, and you can hear them, you can hear them coming home. And you'll hear the footsteps, footsteps getting stronger and stronger. They'll all come home to Yerushalayim. And you know, that's still happening now. But anyway, Reb Shlomo then put, took the, the melody that he wrote a few, a few uh, months prior and then put these words that, uh, that we say, the famous Nusach that he used to do also. But it came about by looking at the Kotel, by being at the Kotel two in the morning with a bunch of different people living prophecies and we're still doing it just last night my my daughter asked me she said when i was putting her to sleep she said was rabbi shlomo ever here in the frat i said yeah sure so she said was he ever here here in this house I'm like no this house is only like five years old four years old she's like well, what was here before and it's like when I said to her, nothing, the, the prophecy of coming back home and building Eretz Yisrael was so alive. And we, we, lose, we lose touch of that today because it's, it's been already like this for 70 years. But, you know, in 1974, being at the Kotel, it was, it was pretty new. You only had the Kotel for about seven years. But this is, this is a moment of prophecy that Rib Shlomo was in the zone and the nigun that he wrote a few months prior found words. And you know the nisa. Vehaya bayoma ho. Vehaya bayoma ho. It'll be on that great day. Ita. Shofar <laughs> Shall I? <laughs> 
Okay, so there's a request to, to learn about uh, when did he write Yibana Amigdash? So again, this is like, this is an example of which one, because there's a bunch. But let's try to do this one fast. The, first, the one of them was the famous story, Yibane Amigdash. That was the story by the bedside of the Chayal that was injured. And, um, this is, that's in Hart Sion. Hart Sion, Mount Zion in the early 70s, I think. Slichos night. Let's sing that one. That's a good nigga. Shabbos, we had, we had Yerushalayim, we had the Beis Ham, we had, a lot of the Beis Ham English. For Shabbos, we had the Kotel, Ibn Shlomo was here, June 67, and Ibn Shlomo was walking down to the Kotel, and this is the nigun that came down. Came down a little bit differently in the beginning, but uh, you all know it, let's sing it, let's sing it strong. <laughs> As it happened quite often after his concerts, when he'd invite everyone to come with him wherever he went, sometimes it would be a cafe, it would be a restaurant. And of course, who ended up paying for everybody? <laughs> 
course he did. And it happened one time after a concert in Svat that Ibn Shlomo, everyone followed him after the concert to a pizza place. I would love to find out who was there. That'd be great to hear it, um, to, to hear from people that were there. I, Ibn Shlomo said that it was time to pay. And this time it really happened to be he just did not have money. He probably already had given all the cash he already got from that concert to somebody else before they got to the pizza place or whatever, whatever the story is. But they didn't have any money. So the owner of the restaurant said to him, Shleimer, I'm, I'll be more of you if you write for me a new nigan on the spot. So this is the nigan that came down on the spot. If you have some last requests, um, I'd be happy and happy and happy to uh, to see if if I if I know the story of it to share with you. We tried getting to some of them. Um, maybe I'll try to see. Maybe we'll we'll just read a, a bit more from his own words about the world of nigunim. Um, Shlomo said like this. In the time of the Beis HaMikdash, every davening was with music. Sadly enough, after Churban Beis HaMikdash, the temple was destroyed and we stopped playing music and look what happened to us. I couldn't say this on my own, but the Holy Optor says this. The Holy Optor says that if our Holy Rabbis would have thought for one second that it would take so long for Mashiach to come, they would have done a lot of things differently. But it was clear to them that Mashiach was coming soon. Imagine if they would have known that it would take 2,000 years until Mashiach has come. Who knows how much they would have done different. According to our tradition, in the Holy Temple, there were 50,000 in instruments and 100,000 voices. And until Mashiach comes, there won't be this kind of music. And in the Holy Temple, there weren't speeches. Just the most awesome, heartbreaking, beautiful melodies. No speeches. Sadly enough, we got away from singing in the synagogue. We didn't think we'll stay away from the Holy Temple for that long. Since it only took 70 years to rebuild the first temple, the rabbis thought that we would be back again after 70 years. 
had they known that it would take 2,000 years until we came back. The Holy Apter Rebbe says that they would have insisted that there would be instruments in the synagogue. Maybe not on Shabbos, but at least during the week, which just for Hever that are born the millennials, there were bringing a, a guitar into a shul 30, 40 years ago was like, it's like eating treif. It's not things you did. How can you pray without music? In house love and prayer, whenever we prayed together during the week, it was always with instruments and singing, outpouring of the heart. I listen to this, Hever. Anyone that's a musician, or shouldn't say musician, any, any servant of God who part of their service of God is through music can understand this in a very deep way. My brother and I talk about this all the time. People who won't stop talking at concerts are inflicting pain on those who want to sing. My father was a very close friend to Reb Moshe Mordechai Epstein, the Heilige Rosh Yeshiva of, of Hebron. It was Lobos Slabotka, right? Shlomo said, when I began singing, he said to me, Shlema, I want you to know something. When people pay to hear you sing, you have to make sure you're singing well, because, because otherwise you're guilty of the Avera of Lotignov. You're stealing their money. Make sure people don't make any noise in the crowd while you're singing, because people pay money to hear. There are moments which can mamish be gan Eden, because when Yidin get together and sing, it is so beautiful. But when there's talking, not only are you going over the Avera of Lotignov, you're taking away Gan Eden from people. And you're also taking away my Gan Eden, which no one said. Shlomo said, imagine how the, now a little bit about his beginning of his music career. Imagine how the first black man felt on stage. Gewalt was he laughed at. Only white men were allowed to be on stage. This is how I felt when I began, he said. They laughed at me. People would ask me, Shlema, why are you making a clown out of yourself? But slowly, slowly, I took the Hasidic melodies to the people, to the street. And now they sing my songs all over the world. I have the privilege to be part of almost every wedding in the world. I once stood outside a big wedding hall that has six wedding halls in the building. I heard one of my nigunim in each of them. Ay, we can go on and on, Hever. It's already late. Ay, I have, we have to run. Um, let's do let's do maybe one more, maybe maybe two more, but let's see, one or two more. Um, this is one of my favorite ones. This is I think mid mid sixties. It's Arab Yom Kippur, right before Yom Kippur. Reb Shlomo is taking, he's exhausted. And he took a little nap right before Yom Kippur. He was exhausted and he had to take a nap before the class started. So he told his father, he had to be early 60s. His father passed away, I believe, in 66. 67, 68. Um, so during his nap, he took a, he took a shluf. And like we said before, how Nigunim came to him in dreams, he dreamt this melody. And when he woke up, he was so scared he'd forget it. So he called his guitar she, uh, teacher, the famous Anita Shear. And she wrote out the notes for him. And in the beginning, this is how he, this is the, the words he would sing. We'll sing it once without the words, because this is, you all know it. And then we'll, I'll tell you what words he composed it to. so in the sneakers of Arab Rosh Hashanah, I believe it also shows up in Arab Yom Kippur, we have the words, Mountain Nikola Vaot Bezot Hashanah. You should 
be able to, to escape any bad news this coming year. So this was the how it just came down. Mountain, we call it out, mountain, we call it out, mountain, we call it out, there's a passion. Mountain, we call it out, mountain, we call it out, mountain, we call it out, there's a passion. I'm just looking at last. Uh, ah, I'm so sorry. There's there's a request here. I don't know how he wrote. Ahavas Adam Tavi Lahem. It is a beautiful, beautiful nigan. I don't know the story. I would love to find out how he wrote Ahavas Adam um, Tavi Lahem. People, what's that? Oh, my wife said to sing it, so we do. We we sing. We do what? What the order is? The holy order. It's a beautiful thing. It came so big in Eretz Yisrael the last few years. Thank you for being with us, dearest friends. Bum, 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 I have a Okay, someone asked for, for an, uh, an unknown nigun. We'll do this is the last one, Chevra, and hopefully we'll learn, we'll have a chance to learn a little bit later today. Um, what's a good one? An unknown nigun, there, there. Everything used to be unknown. <laughs> now everyone knows everything. What could be a good unknown nigun? Do you have any requests? Unknown? Uh, okay. This is one of my favorite ones. Really is. Uh, 
Thank you. Thank you. We could stay for hours. Hopefully we'll have many more, more years. I'm sorry I didn't get to all of them. But Baruch Hashem, there's such a, you know, that's beautiful. As deep as these, as, as these nigunim are, you know, let's just, um, just take into heart this last paragraph from Rip Shlomo about music. And um, this is just, this kind of says it all, I think. Shlomo said, I want to find it perfect. I want to make sure it's very clear. You know what hurts me the most? There's a whole trend today in the so-called Jewish music scene. Basically, it's bang, bang, and another bang, bang, bang. Between one note and another, there's scotch tape because it doesn't really connect. My brother and I, one time we were, we were driving around New York and we decided we're gonna, let's write a whole album of this kind of songs right away. They're not nigunim. These are just songs, cheap songs where you basically like take a pasuk and you think of the latest beat. And, and like you said, you put scotch tape between the notes and hey, there you have a song. One time I came to someone and this person says to me, Shlema, you're terrible. You only listen to your own music. You should really listen to other people's music. So I said to him, brother, I want it to come from my heart and not somebody else's heart. But you know what? Put on a record for me. I'm ready to listen. He puts on a record. Rabbi Shlomo says, and I'm listening in. This person was watching my face. It was like a little sardine, a piece of herring, a little white fish with a little cracker. One note didn't connect to the next note. Some people really know music. They're sitting down by the piano, making up melodies. I'm not knocking it. It's beautiful. But something's missing. Sadly enough, the taste of music has gone so low, below sea level. But maybe one day the world will again know what music is. I want to bless you and me and all of Israel. Our taste of music should become so much more refined. If you change one word in a sentence, it's a different sentence. By melodies, it's thousands of times more true. I'm always hoping and praying to take out the cheapness of Jewish music. There's a cheap beginning and a cheap ending. My melodies are not cheap. From beginning to end, every note has to be in there. L'chaim, everyone. Thank you for being with us. Bezrat Hashem, we're going to end the Yorzeit day. We're going to wait for the Chavra in New York and LA to wake up, for the early risers in LA. And we're going to learn again at 4 p.m., um, which is... 6 a.m. L.A. and I think it's 9 a.m. in New York. Uh, we'll end off the day strong as well, around 4, but we'll send out a notice. This is very special. I'm so glad we did this. 
And we're sending a lot of love from Eretz Asher Eine Hashem Elokecha Ba Mireshit Hashana Ve'ad Acharit Shana.